Yeah. 
Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. And praying together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord have mercy. to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Ezekiel, beginning with the 34th chapter, the 11th verse. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples, and gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabitants inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, <clears throat> and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough? 
for you to feed on the good pasture, that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture, and to drink of clear water, that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet, and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Standing, let us pray responsibly from Psalm 95. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Can we stop right there? I'm sorry. We are doing Psalm 95 from the uh, from the Coverdale Psalter, and it's in. I, I believe it's in your bulletin. It must not have made it to the. I think it's. It appears to be the same. I've got the words on. Yeah, this is, I think, the um, uh, English Standard Version. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In, in his hands are all the depths of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is the people that err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways. Of whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. <coughs> Glory, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. <coughs> A reading from the book of 1 Corinthians, beginning with the 15th chapter, the 20th verse. Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says, all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. 
Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a, shep- as, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Please be seated. to call the children forward so that we can pray with you before you go to your time together. I think some of them are already downstairs, maybe. So we will pray for you guys. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we bless you for having blessed us with the joy and care of children. Give us calm strength and patient wisdom so to train them that they may love all that is true and pure and lovely and praiseworthy, following the example of their Savior, Jesus Christ. May they never know a day apart from you. We bless them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the confusion about the song was entirely my fault. Uh, I had the great idea. Normally we read our psalms from the, East, uh, I was going to say the Eastern Shore version, the English Standard <laughs> Version. I'm sorry. But that's what people in Stevensville call it. The ESV. Um, but but uh, because, because the Coverdale Psalter in the prayer book is meant to be sung, and it's sometimes a little awkward to say it, and it's not psalms in the way that we're used to hearing them. So we read from the ESV, but with Psalm 95, this is a psalm that we say every day in morning prayer. And so it's one we're very familiar with and know by heart, a lot of us. And so I swap them. I swap them. Um, I forgot to swap them in here, so entirely my fault. So the meaning of the title, Christ or Messiah, is king, literally anointed one, chosen and set apart to rule. 
And we know that in Christ's first advent, he was far from recognized as such by all but a few. Rather than being crowned with a royal diadem, as the great hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, declares. By the way, one of the reasons I love singing hymns is because you never get to say the word ineffably anywhere, except if you're singing the hymn, crown him with many credits. Ineffably sublime. And potentate. Yes, and potentate of time, that's right. But rather than being crowned with a royal diadem, as the great hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, declares he was crowned with thorns while soldiers mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, and Pilate cynically condemned him to death, labeling him with those same sarcastic and mean words. But we believe that his death wasn't the end, but rather showed that he was indeed a king of a far greater kingdom when God raised him from the dead. And we believe that after he rose, he was honored by being exalted to the highest place. As Paul wrote beautifully in Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Today, we celebrate the feast of Christ the King, so it's great that we have a feast like three days after Thanksgiving, isn't it? Um, the last Sunday, in the church calendar and the culmination culmination of the church's year, which begs the question, or ought to, why the church calendar? I mean, we're coming to the end of the year anyway. And I can tell you in two words, spiritual formation. The people who wrote some of the most profound liturgical prayers from St. John Chrysostom in the 4th century to Thomas Cranmer in the 16th century Book of Common Prayer were zealous followers of Jesus and diligent scholars of the scriptures. And when the seasons of the church calendar were developed, they developed as a way to aid in the spiritual formation of those who sought to follow Christ in the same way. Easter was, of course, the first church-wide event commemorated. Lent, then, was the earliest actual season to develop and be adopted by the whole church by around A.D. 330. The other seasons of the church year, like Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, and Pentecost, which today, I don't know if you noticed that on our bulletins, normally the way that we mark time is in relationship in ordinary time, is in relationship to Pentecost. Today would be the 26th Sunday after Pentecost. By around the 11th or the 12th century, the church year was fully formed, save the Feast of Christ the King, which is a relatively recent addition, established by Pope Pius XI in 1925 as a response to the terrible disillusionment and despair wrought by World War I in Europe. His desire was to reaffirm the kingship and ultimate authority of Christ over all aspects of human life, spiritual, political, interpersonal, and economic. But so what? I mean, ancient or modern, why ought we apply our lives to these things today? To say it simply, the liturgical year was developed to help disciple believers in a world of ignorance and distraction, which doesn't sound dissimilar from our day, to spiritually form us more and more into the image of Christ. And there are two main ways that it does this. First, it centers us on Christ. As Christianity spread, many of the church's members, and for a time in the, in the early Middle Ages, many of its clergy were illiterate and ignorant of the scriptures and theology. 
A year that would center them on Christ was a way of helping them, teaching them, placing them in a rhythm of living that helped them reflect on Christ and to know him. The liturgical year follows the life of Christ. It begins with anticipating his coming and return in Advent, celebrating his birth at Christmas, marveling at his revealing during Epiphany, humbling ourselves in repentance as we join in the fasting, as we join in his fasting in the wilderness during Lent. Have you ever wondered why Lent is 40 days long? Because Jesus fasted 40 days. Reflecting on his passion during Holy Week, remembering our sin and the weight of all the world's evil that he carried on the cross on Good Friday, embracing the silent emptiness of Holy Saturday, celebrating the breaking forth of new life at Easter and during Easter tide, rejoicing in his giving of the Spirit and his work in the church during Pentecost, then trusting that his presence is still with us during all those weeks of ordinary time. And the liturgical year continues to help us center our lives, not around temporal concerns and distractions, but around Christ. The other thing it does is to more fully connect us, not in name only, but viscerally with the body of Christ. We talk often about wanting the church to be in unity, and we pray for it. But then we dismiss often its traditions as empty rituals. But what if these sacred traditions can be a way of actually um, helping us to walk together in unity? One of, the, one of the real benefits of practicing Lent, for example, is that when you're fasting during Lent, something you feel in your body, you're fasting alongside hundreds of millions of Christians all around the world at the very same time. All the church's feasts and fasts and seasons and holy days do the very same thing. The scriptures that we read today were read about seven hours ago in Africa. And in Europe, we're joining with the church in that way. But the bottom line is you don't need, you don't need to care about the church calendar. You don't, you don't have to celebrate Lent or participate in Ash Wednesday. These are not requirements or laws. But then again, you don't need to have a date night with your spouse. And you don't need to take family vacations. But rhythms and routines are potent ways of reinforcing and even building desire. It's because I want to nurture my relationship with Lauren that we have date nights. It's because we desired that our family be deeply connected, that we took vacations together and had and have some pretty inviolable family rituals and traditions. In the same way, it's because I want to nurture my relationship with Christ and because I want to be connected to the body of Christ that I gladly embrace the rituals and traditions of the liturgical year. It's a sacred rhythm, routine, that reinforces and intensifies a desire to follow Christ and become like him, create the space for his spirit to shape us. And it's a powerful reminder that we're not the first to follow Christ. Nor are we the only ones attempting to do so today. We're joining a great communion of saints and sinners, the people of God, journeying together. And as we finish the church year, we look today to the end, not merely as conclusion, but as completion the fulfillment of the purpose and work toward which all that Jesus said and did was directed. We anticipate the day when his power and great glory as king will be fully revealed and Christ will sit as righteous judge. This is something we affirm every week in the Nicene Creed, God's power exercised through Christ at the end 
just as the world was made through him in the past, now and in the future, he lives and reigns forever. The gospel readings over the past several weeks have given texture to that future, vivid images in several parables that we've looked at. And here in the final one, the parable of the sheep and the goats, the king of kings seated on his heavenly throne is judging the people of all the nations of the earth. The final judgment is the climactic passage in the discourse at the end times that spans Matthew 24 and 25. And here we get the New Testament's only detailed depiction of the final judgment. The, 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 this dramatic scene follows a series of exhortations and parables through which Jesus has taught his followers what constitutes right living as we await his return in glory. The passage opens with a vivid description of the Son of Man's coming in glory, accompanying accompanied by the angels seated on his throne. The nations are then gathered and separated into two groups, sheep and goats. It was common at the time for shepherds to have mixed flocks. At night, they routinely separated the sheep from the goats. Sheep got to enjoy the open air of the pastures, while goats had to be sheltered from the cold. And because sheep had more commercial value, they were preferred over goats. As a shepherd, Jesus separates the sheep who are placed at his right hand from the goats on his left. The picture of Jesus as shepherd then morphs into the image of Jesus as king. And as king, he's vested with God's power to execute judgment. He declares the sheep blessed by God and invites them to inherit the fullness of kingdom. They are blessed because they fed the king when he was hungry. They gave him drink when he was thirsty. They welcomed him when he was a stranger. They clothed him when he was naked. They cared for him when he was sick. And they visited him when he was in prison. But they're perplexed because they can't recall ever having done those things to him. And he tells them they'd done so whenever they were merciful to one of the least of these, my brothers. Next. The king declares the goats cursed and consigns them to eternal fire. They're cursed because they did not feed, give drink, welcome, clothe, or visit Jesus in his need. Like the sheep, the goats are confounded. When? When had they failed to serve? Jesus responds that their lack of merciful care for the least of these was neglect of him. Thus, the goats will go to punishment, while the sheep, now called righteous, will inherit eternal life. Obviously, there's been a lot of debate among theologians and commentators over the centuries about just what Jesus meant by this parable. By the phrases, all the nations, ethne, in verse 32, and the least of these, my brothers, in verses 40 and 45. Some more recent commentators point out that elsewhere in Matthew's gospel, Jesus uses the word ethne to refer specifically to Gentiles. Moreover, he uses the phrase, the least of these my brothers, to describe specifically his disciples. They argue that it's reasonable to expect that Jesus retains both of those meanings here. So, for them, this passage depicts judgment only of Gentiles, understood here as non-Christians and non Jews, with the sole criterion for declaring them righteous or not, being whether they have dealt mercifully with Jesus' disciples. These are the least of these with whom the Son of Man identifies, his brothers and his sisters. It's specifically talking about showing mercy to Christians. <clears throat> and this should lead us to ask, if this is true, that his, this judgment is only about treating Jesus' disciples well, why so much talk about the poor? Doesn't this kind of just get us off the hook? But the more ancient interpretive traditions, both East and West, read this passage more universally. That is, the nations refers to all people, as in God so loved the world including Christians, and the least of these refers to anyone 
was in need. The huge problem with that, of course, becomes the issue of eternal reward or condemnation based here in this passage entirely on works. What about grace? Aren't, aren't we saved entirely by grace through faith and not at all by works? It may not surprise some of you that as an Enneagram 9, the peacemaker, I see truth in both of these interpretations and value in them. It, that, it, that does not force them to be mutually exclusive. In fact, I think having to see it as one or the other either minimizes the reality of judgment or creates a false dichotomy. These final weeks of the church year have been, we've been reading lots of passages on judgment from both the Old and the New Testaments. I mean, week after week. And so, so it's probably time to say something about grace and judgment. And it ought to give us both hope and pause. 